Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another week of NFL Podcasting. This is your boy, the playmaker, down there, Silas, and as always, when I put all down, how you doing? Doing good, doing good. How about y'all? Hey, back for another week is Gabe. What's going on, Gabe? Nothing much. Good to be back. This week, we're talking about the South. We're beginning to Dallas's division since he's a Jaguar fan. But first up, we're going to talk about the NFC South with Gabe. And, uh, as we get, go ahead and get us started with the NFC South. Yeah, so the NFC South this year, and um, like most years, it's always a battle. Uh, you know, three really good teams at the top, and the New Orleans Saints, Atlanta Falcons, and Carolina Panthers, with, you know, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers a little bit behind them. But last year, I saw the Saints uh, run away with the division with a 13-3 and record. And uh, that really was surprising for a lot of people, including myself. I thought the Falcons and Panthers both would be competitive last year in the division, but injuries and uh, set of circumstances to Cam Newton and other players really hindered the NFC South from being as competitive as it should be. So I'm expecting a lot more uh, uh, fight and uh, competitiveness within the division this year. Dallas, what you got for the NFC? Oh. Um, basically what Gabriel said. I mean, it's three really good teams. Then there's a team at the bottom. And that's pretty much how you sum it up. There's no real other way to really look at the NFC South except for that way. It's odd to think that everybody in that division has their quarterback, it would seem, because I feel like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, with a new head coach, and the same offseason that they let go of a franchise cornerstone and gave his number to another defensive tackle that's on a one-year deal, I feel like this would have been the perfect time for them to draft a new quarterback or just try to get a placeholder in free agency. But they didn't. That being said, I mean, the way they are right now, Pete, because the Tampa Bay Buccaneers – in the top three. I know they finished in the top three. I want to say they were number one. I know they finished in the top three in passing yards and total yards per game. So they were able to throw it through the air. But, you know, even though it's a passing league and the run game is kind of sort of dying back, just being able to throw the ball doesn't mean that you'll win a bunch of games because their defense was lacking. They had no balance. Their run game was lacking. And they didn't trust Jameis. Now, granted, Jameis, you know, couldn't start the season, but still. So... Yeah, as far as who would win it, though, I still think it's the Saints' division to lose because the Saints are younger and better for the most part. I think the only real hole that they might have compared to last year is you wonder how how much Teron Ter- Armstead can stay healthy and if he can give them at least 14 to 15 games in the regular season because he's been having injury issues for a while. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with uh, with uh, Dallas's assessment on the, the Saints. It is by far their, their division to lose uh, as of right now, but I do think it will be much tighter because I do think the Falcons have improved defensively and that Carolina has added some blue chip pieces as well, including Gerald McCoy. From the, from the Buccaneers, that was a really big haul for them. But the Saints, listen, they, they, they still have Drew Brees, and they still have probably the best one-two combo with wide receiver one, running back in Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara. And they just picked up Jared Cook from the, from the Raiders last year, who had a tremendous year with Derek Carr throwing to him. So who knows how Drew Brees is going to use all his weapons uh, this year. He had... Arguably his best year last year, and if it wasn't for Patrick Mahomes, then he would have probably won his first regular season MVP. So, yeah, the Saints are definitely the top team in this division right now, and I think that they'll be uh, Super Bowl favorites amongst uh, several other teams, but it's going to be a much harder route to win the division this year because of the Falcons and their potent offense with the wide receiver trio of Julio Jones, Sanu, and Calvin Ridley, along with Austin Hopper, uh, Hooper, sorry, who had a very good year last year. Uh, I, and the Carolina Panthers, if Cam Newton can just stay upright for an entire season, he's 
proven to be one of the best top 10 quarterbacks in the league. And Christian McCaffrey really had a breakout season. Uh, I think that uh, bolstering their defense will, will definitely help them uh, compete even more so. But I, I, I see this as a bounce back year for both the Falcons and the Panthers, who finished with identical seven and nine records that they'll be uh, on the Saints tail more towards the end of the season and trying to snatch away the divisional crown from them. Well, I would say that social media agrees with both of y'all. As we did last week, uh, we did some polls. And uh, Dallas, mm-hmm. Facebook, together we had 72 votes. Oh, hey. it's pretty good. And uh, guess what percentage the Saints got? Was it the majority? 67%. Oh, well. Number two was the Falcons with 21%, followed by Carolina, 7%, and Tampa Bay, 5%. Man, people actually said Tampa? I guess only yeah. from Tampa. <laughs> they must have voted from there. Yeah. <laughs> we got to combine four, four votes. And Carolina only got five. So it's looking like Saints and Falcons. So like a two-team race. Yeah. But you mentioned, you mentioned a new head coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Bruce Arian. I'd like to see what he's going to do with James Winston. No to sign Jackson in Tampa. He's back home in Philly. Mm-hmm. They did. This is which you was a little bit too earlier. Nothing really big in Carolina. Just can Cam Newton stay upright, as Gabriel said. The Saints did lose Mark Ingram, so more of a load will be on Alvin Kamara. We'll see how that. However, they did were able to land Latavius Murray, who from the Vikings. He, they signed him to a four-year deal, so he will try and uh, get a lot of the backup uh, roles and trying to take the load off of Kamara, too. I think that was a sneaky good uh, signing for the Saints to nab Murray. The Falcons, as Gary said, they added Jerry McCoy. They also added J.J. Wilcox in the secondary. They getting Deion Jones back. They getting Keanu Neal back. So they should be healthy going into this, se- this season. By the way, back to the Saints, Michael Thomas is the highest paid wide receiver ever. Yeah, Michael Thomas also had like 90% of the targets. Then, like, Michael so, Thomas had, like, 150 targets, 140-something targets. The next closest wide receiver only had, like, 38. Yeah, no, so, he, led, he led the league in receptions last year. So that just shows you how heavily uh, used and, and how favored he was in uh, Drew Brees' corner. And I wonder how Jared Cook, how his presence, if he can have a sort of uh, Jimmy Graham impact that he did while he was on the Saints, if he can have that sort of offensive impact spread out the field a little more for Drew Brees. I'm really excited to see what the Saints' offense is is like this year. Well, check this out. The NFC South got to go against the NFC West this whole season. Huh. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a tough schedule for, for a lot of them, especially the Falcons, man. Oh, I don't know if y'all have seen the Falcons' schedule, but it is oh, it is rough. It gets better, Dallas, because guess what? What? The two divisions we're talking about today play each other. It's the battle for the South this year. Oh, the NFC South has that all there. Yeah, we'll get to the NFC South in our next segment. But just so you know, it's the battle for the South this year. AFC and NFC South. It's it, the NFC South is going to run away with it. Even Tampa's going to get some games. Oof. Oh man, I can't wait to hear what you got to say when we go to the NFC South. Yeah, I know. But oh, the tweet I did, I did, I did catch, I did try to look at the extra two games that everybody would have. And you're right. The first two games for Atlanta is at Minnesota and home to Philly. Yeah, the Falcons schedule is is brutal, honestly, if I'm looking at it, because they have to play on the road for, like you said, Minnesota, uh, the, the be a tough game, uh, the Texans. And so that's in the first eight weeks they play the Vikings, the Eagles, the Colts, the Texans, the Rams, the Seahawks. And then the second half of their schedule is 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 where it will be basically make and break for their season. Because the first five games are against their divisional opponents. They don't play any divisional opponents in the first half. And then they play six of the eight of the, of the second half games are against their divisional foes. Starting off with uh, – at at the Saints and at uh, Carolina for the first two weeks. So, man, that's going to be a brutal stretch for them. Yeah, exactly. So, 
they, they, they're going to be on the spotlight and, uh, you know, it's going to be, it, it'll be tough for them, honestly. It's, their defense will have to go back to what they were in 2017 because last year, although there were a lot of starters that were injured uh, throughout the season, uh, like, like Vic Beasley had some limited playing time. Uh, if everyone can go back strong, then they'll have a good shot. But, man, that schedule doesn't do them any favors. By the way, um, Tevin Coleman is in San Francisco. They got to go to San Francisco week 15. Yeah, no. I'm pretty sure. So for that game. And Kyle Shanahan. Who's the and then, quarterback back. And then Dallas Jaguars go to the ATL week 16 before they finish off with Tevin. I mean, that'll all depend, I guess. So I did. I do expect Atlanta to be better, but that schedule, whew. Yeah, it's a grinder. Easy. It's weird how their schedule is so hard, and they, di- they didn't make the playoffs last year. No, only the Saints made the playoffs in that division. Yeah, like, why is their schedule so hard and they won a playoff team? In my mind, in fact, they don't – matter of fact, the Saints don't want to the have a winning season in that division. Yeah. How was their division so hard and they had a losing season? Well, schedule. I mean, they, they, they were only seven and nine, so maybe the, the, the football gods didn't do them any favors uh, by saying, hey, you're only one game under 500. You should be better. But, I mean, they have to face the, the AFC South, in, especially for the Falcons. A lot of their games will be away, like the, that game against the, the Colts away at week three and the Texans week five. Those are tough games, so – I don't know. It's just pretty unfortunate for them, you know, like you said, since they were, they they weren't a winning team last year and they ended up being tied for second with the Panthers in that division, but their schedule is ridiculous. I mean, let's look at the Saints schedule. Who actually won a division? At home Monday night football against Houston. That's the first of two Monday night games. Then they gotta come all the way to LA to take on the Rams. And they got to stay out. And you got to play Seattle in week three. Week four, they home on Sunday night football against the Cowboys before they get to Tampa. I mean, the same schedule doesn't do them no favors either. They got to, they got to go to Soldier Field too. But I mean, them having a hard schedule makes sense. They got to the division round. No, they got to the NFC Championship. Oh, yeah. yeah. There were there were one blown call, miss uh, pass interference call, which they can obviously challenge now thanks to that game from being in the Super Bowl. So it's crazy to think that, that – but that – and, yeah, and I think that's why that I don't think that the Saints will get to the same record that they did last year, and it'll be a much closer race. I see them more at, as a 10-11 win team, which is still very good, but – just because the schedule in general for the NFC South is harder, it's going to be really hard for the Saints to to replicate the type of season where they were able to pull nine straight wins last year. It's that's their schedule this year, unless unless their offense is out of this world again and their defense can uh, you know be be at least competent in the you know middle of the pack defense, then they'll have a chance. But yeah, for the for the Saints uh, and also the Falcons and the Panthers and I guess the Bucks too, the NFC South is just going to be a real Real battle this year. I mean, the Bucks, they first three games could mean a lot because they at home against San Fran, they got to go to Carolina, and they home to the Giants. So if they can come out of the two and one, that's a good start before they got to come to LA and then play at New Orleans before they play, before they go to London to play Carolina again. Yeah, definitely. And it's going to be interesting to see how uh, how Bruce Arians and also Todd Bowles as the new defensive coordinator, how they're going to do uh, trying to uh, guide the, the Buccaneers to, to relevancy again because they haven't made the playoffs in over 10 years now. They've had 511 records, back-to-back seasons. But if, uh, if they can have a really strong defense under Bowles and if Arians can uh, become the quarterback guru for Jameis Winston really – light a fire on under him and get him back to what he was in, the, in his rookie year, then I think the Buccaneers will surprise a lot of people. But a lot hinges on that on that defense because, like we said before, they have the weapons with Mike Evans. And even though they lost to Sean Jackson, they still have Adam Humphreys and, and Chris Godwin and amongst others. So I'm really interested to see what they do with that defense because uh, although they did sign Dominican Sue, I think the best – uh, move for them in this offseason was drafting Devin White 
because he was a beast at LSU, you know. So if 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 their defense can uh, even be a, a little bit better than they were the last uh, year or so, then I think Tampa will will definitely be improved from last year. But it'll be interesting to see. Now the main concern with Carolina is Cam Newton, right? Dallas. Yeah. What he did to Carolina. Say that again. They. Against the player who was ranked number one by the, by his peers on the NFL top one hundred players. And which year? Out the gate. Cam Newton has to deal with Aaron Donald week one. Oh man, that's <laughs> yeah. Your lead up was weird. I was trying to figure out where you were going with this, but yeah, like it's crazy because the Pro Bowler, the perennial Pro Bowler, Trey Turner. I don't think he faces Aaron Donald. I think Trey Turner lines up on the left side, which would be facing the offense, the right side. So, like, Aaron's going to be on the right guard, and I think Trey's on the other side. So, yeah, that's not a good look. Ran about Cam Panther fans, I ran about Cam Newton. Well, my L.A. Rams are coming in town week one. Yeah, that's going to be a big test for, the, for Cam Newton and that offensive line. So... Uh, I think they they did make some strides in addressing that. They were able to land the you know the top free agent center in uh, Matt Paredes, but uh, yeah, no, like <laughs> having to face Aaron Donald on the line week one, it'll it'll be interesting to see uh, if Cam Newton can stay healthy throughout these sixteen games. So, uh, and if not, you know, I think that that dra- drafting Will Greer in the third round will be end up being pretty huge if uh, Cam Newton misses some time. So. We'll we'll see how that uh, shakes out, but it's going to be a lot of onus on that offensive. And not line. to mention, if you when you get done facing Aaron Donald, you'll be facing the Giants who the following week with Tampa Bay. Yep, Thursday night, and Gerald McCoy with the Panthers. So I mean, sorry, that was with the Panthers, but yeah, no, just what this whole division. It's that uh, they've they've got some some dogs out there that can get after the quarterback, uh, and I think it's going to be. Uh, you know, a very interesting year for Cam Newton if he can get away from guys like uh, Cameron Jordan and uh, and uh, Jason Pierre-Paul, guys like that, even Aaron Donald. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a, a tough one for him. But I think uh, I think that Christian McCaffrey will also be a big part of that if he can sort of use him as the way Le'Veon Bell was for for Ben Roethlisberger sort of dunking off the ball to him when the pressure gets too much because McCaffrey had a great year last year, but he's going to need a lot more help if he, if Cam Newton wants to get through this season. Pretty pretty much. I think Dallas have, has Christian McCaffrey and Sir Conrad in the same category, right? Well, for this yeah, damn Kamara. Though, because those are running backs where it's like they have a very good chance to lead their teams in receiving, either receptions, yards, or both. Right. Those three running backs are the ones where it's like, yeah, they're in a whole different world when it comes to what the NFL is after for their running backs nowadays and what being a bell cow really means. Yeah, they're true the way, dual threats. They, 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 they are trying to give us Cam Newton versus Aaron Rodgers up at Lambeau Field Week 10. The question is, is either of them going to make it there? Because it's not like Aaron Rodgers yep. all stays healthy. Yeah, that'll be that'll be a key if, if both of them can can make it to Week Ten. That'll be a great matchup. But in recent years, it, uh, the injury bug has not been kind to them. It will be interesting to see uh, Kyle Murray go against Cam Newton in Week Three and Deshaun Watson versus Cam in Week Four. Both road games, by the way. It's just the Deshaun and- Cam matchup is going to be more interesting because it seems like Deshaun. When you look at the new generation quarterbacks, when Cam finally, like you know fouls out, I think Deshaun's going to take over that spot of, like, who is going to be the actual dual threat in the NFL. Right now, it's between Deshaun and Russell. And, you know, well, and it depends on Lamar, because when you say dual threat, you really have to have the air along with the ground. But as far as being able to pass and run, right now, it's Deshaun and Russell. So that is going to be interesting. Kyler, though, I I don't know, because I'm still skeptical on how the Texas Tech Red Raiders offense is going to work in the NFL when you have the worst offensive personnel in the league running it, so. Well, you can, you'll be able to talk more about that next week when we get into the West. Seems like um, 
you guys are all on the same page. It's the Saints, and everybody else do something. It's, what it sounds like. it's a really, really, really hard division. I think that we're not really being innovative here. I don't think we're giving really hot content. I think almost everybody's saying fairly the same thing. It's everybody but Tampa has a chance. Yep, exactly. And that's why it's going to be one of the more intriguing divisions. Uh, and I think that it's going to be much closer than it was last year. Uh, I, I can see the Saints with a top out between uh, 10 and 11 wins and the Falcons 9 and 10 wins and the Panthers around that area too. But, yeah, it's 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 those three and the Buccaneers, which, uh, you know, at least at least there's three teams that are going to be involved, like other like other divisions. It's not going to be as one sided, so it's going to be a really fun to watch this year, and especially with each team having the having a pretty rough schedule compared to last year, it's going to show the uh, if the Saints are you know for real as Super Bowl contenders again this year, and uh, if the Falcons and Panthers can get back to the that Super Bowl level that they've shown in the past uh, few years. Sorry, Bucks. Nobody believes in you. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's all the rough yeah. parts of being a Florida team because nobody believes in the Jags and Dolphins either. Hey, at least oh, you yeah, got the we... Jacksonville Jaguars, oh, sort of. We're going to get into that one real quickly. We're going to get into that one very soon because uh, you're going to be surprised about these numbers from social media. I'm just going to put that out. Not from Twitter. So, uh, we'll do it for this one, Gabe. Thank you for coming back and talking to NFC South. Of course, man. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me on. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, it's all about the AFC South, and Dallas get to talk about his Jaguars. Yeah, he fucked the Titans. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Now we're going to talk about the other side of the conversation, AFC South. Okay. But with the with the asset is Jason. I'm all right, man. How you doing? Okay, so uh, AOC South won by the Houston Texans last year. Deshaun Watson, JJ Ward, DeAndre Hopkins, Javion Clowney, all that good stuff. But it's a new year. Andrew Luck already questioning himself. Already. Jacksonville got Nick Foles, and the Tennessee Titans is right. still the Tennessee Titans. You know, so uh. As we always do, uh, we let our guests go first. So, Jason, go ahead and break well, like down the said, AFC the South. The Texans sports. are the running champs. Um, I mean, they did lose the wild card game to the Colts, so that's kind of a downer. Um, I guess a big issue right now is dealing with Clowney and uh, his holdout. But, uh, I mean, they're looking pretty sacked to start. Uh, they have a tough road ahead, but with Deshaun leading the way, it can't be much, too much difficulty in their way. So, Dallas, yeah. this is your like, division, you know, sir. Just move out the way, Darnell. I'm going to drive the train. Um, the NFC South is basically a question of who wants to win a division the most. Whereas the AFC South, when you look at the situations and the scenarios top to bottom, you're really asking who wants to lose it the least. The Tennessee Titans right now have a former first-round pick, a former franchise quarterback that's also middling at Forever 500 and Ryan Tannehill. On the roster, the same year, Marcus Mariota is probably desiring a deal. A lot of people are wondering, is this the final year for Marcus Mariota in Tennessee? And all Mike, Mike Vrabel did to help motivate his quarterback is get a guy who was just a franchise quarterback of the Dolphins who are now rebuilding. To have a former first-round pick and a guy who, like, let's be real, Ryan Tannehill has won games in this league. Ryan Tannehill has started playoff games in this league. So to kind of write off the fact that it's one of the very, very low budding quarterback controversies in the NFL, that, that would be unwise. That being said, I mean, Derrick Henry kind of emerged last year. The question is, in a division that's full of running back talent, can Derrick Henry be the star back of the division. Can Derrick Henry be the back that's consistent and the back that, if I remember correctly, for a while now, we haven't had back-to-back 1,000-yard -back backs. I know the Colts haven't had one. Leonard Fournette, he was nicked up and getting suspended. So the AFC South basically is a rough-and-tumble division. 
gone are the days of Peyton Manning just lighting us up for 40 every game and throwing for 500 and everybody else just figuring it out. You've got to play tough in this division. And offensive line is an issue for the Jaguars and the um, Texans. Andrew Luck is already nicked up. So even with the way that the offensive line played last year and with their guard, Quentin Nelson, being an all-pro as a rookie, you have to wonder, is that much more important? And can you really expect a line that made such a huge jump in one offseason to maintain that kind of level of play again? Really, it's all a matter of if the quarterback gets hurt or underperforms in any way, these teams really don't have that kind of juice to keep going. It's like the Carolina Panthers situation last year when Cam Newton had the shoulder injury and tried to play through it. Except it's all four teams. If Andrew Luck can't play at least 12 games this season, right the Colts off. If Marcus Mariota is in like week seven and he only has like six touchdowns, you can write him and the Titans off because now they're going to be trying to see who the quarterback should be next year. If Deshaun Watson, God forbid, they drafted a tackle from D1AA in the first round and the reports are they're moving him inside to guard and having um, Sean, like, God, dude from Miami, but whatever. There's another dude who's been bouncing around the league that's supposed to be playing right tackle, and they're moving Titus Howard in at guard. So it's really a situation of, like, you don't know if the quarterbacks are going to stay upright. And when these quarterbacks go down, it's it's a wrap because as good as the Jaguar season, Jaguars defense was last season, they went 5-11. and 11. As good as the Texas pass rush was last year, they couldn't touch Andrew Luck. And as good as the Tennessee Titans defense was, and they now have the highest paid safety in the NFL, they couldn't keep themselves in games when they just came down to pure scoring. So, in a nutshell, these division, this division only has one truly elite quarterback, but he can't stay healthy. So all of these teams are really in trouble when you're talking about how to compete in the broad scope of the NFL. When it comes to quarterback, that's – I mean – that's their weakest opponent, like for real, is having the issue of can they stay healthy? With Henry, I mean, right now he's having a calf issue. That's not ideal for your, I guess, leading back. Uh, and I just saw a thing today about Fournette and them wanting to get 50 uh, uh, pass attempts to him. I mean, that's going to help his numbers a lot if he can stay healthy. Um Cootie's out right now. He's got that anchor, ankle injury, and, I mean, they just added Duke, and, of course, he's has a hamstring issue. That's always something to worry about. Um, I mean, Lamar's going to be that guy who will get all the touches, but they're not going to score. It's just when it comes to your running backs, at least in Houston, you have uh, Watson who throws the fifth – he had the fifth most in the red zone throwing touchdowns. I mean, that's kind of hard to – really battle, you know. So while you think uh, Lamar could have a good shot or it's more likely going to be Duke getting those touches down there, especially if uh, Kiki's out. and So it's tough. I mean, like you said, the, it's for sure this division stuff. It's all going to be close. It's been back and forth. Uh, Houston's been on top a lot more in the past, I guess, four years than anybody else. But even then, I mean, it is a really competitive division for sure. So before I mm-hmm. dive into this, Dallas, I ask you, my brother, how do you feel about Nick Foles being your quarterback? I mean, <sighs> sorry, Jason. They sure fucked up the cap to do it. They messed up the cap with Blake Bortles. Had to cut him, but didn't cut him as a post June first designation. So they destroyed the cap cutting Blake. Cut a lot of veterans and key pieces from the previous year to make room in the cap. Signed Nick, destroyed the cap again. And now with Nick being the quarterback, you have to wonder. Nick has had chances in the NFL with much more developed and established offenses offensive coordinators, offensive head coaches, and just overall philosophies and weapons in the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Jacksonville Jaguars are in a situation right now where it's like, dude, we don't even know if we're going to have the vaunted defense in place to help him out after this year. Between the fact that Jalen wants money, 
Yannick wants money. Calais Campbell's working on an option. We probably won't be able to afford Marcel Darius after this year because of his cap hit. So it's like, dude, it's not so much I feel bad about having Nick. It's the fact of like, dude, y'all went out and adjusted the cap, redid the cap, did what you had to do to basically overbid against yourselves. We were bas- It was basically whatever we were going to offer Nick and then somebody maybe would have put some skin in the game. But really, everybody was waiting for us to float out an offer. There was really nobody else in the running. By the time everything even started, even the Broncos had already had Joe Flacco. So, I mean, in case Keenum had already went to the um, Redskins because of the Joe Flacco thing. So it was like all the people, all the teams who really needed to find a quarterback to save their job and have a decent season, they already had something lined up. Hell, the Chargers even got Tyrod Taylor to be the backup. We were the only team that was in the running to get Nick. And we did a, a cap hell of a deal after getting out of a cap hell of a deal. So we'll have to see because I don't feel like Nick Foles is a 4,500, 35-plus touchdown a year dude. He's had enough years to show us. Now, he is very efficient. He is a winner. He might be able to be the quarterback, whereas, like, his stats aren't pretty, but we're, you know, 9-7 and seven on the outside looking in. But – I don't know if he's the kind of quarterback that can carry a team. He's going to have to carry the team. Our cap is hell. Yeah, I mean, I have them losing a lot this year. But at the same time, it's going to be a growing year for sure. Um, You guys literally, like, switched out your entire uh, coaching staff and added Filippo, which will help a lot. I mean, I think that's going to help with the throwing for sure. Uh, And with Foles being as safe as he is, I think it's a – nice step in the right direction, but it's going to have to be a development, like you said. I mean, they're going – they have Didi there who's going to just ball out. Um, I think I'm worried about Lee just because of the injury, but, I mean, they, they have all the right pieces. It's just if they can put it together and actually make a run based on their coaching changes and having that right mindset to go forward. Okay, so problems for every team, in my opinion. Tennessee – like, I think men talked about this a lot last year. For some reason, they beat Jacksonville, but everybody else, we don't know what the hell is going on with Tennessee. The Colts, pretty much Andrew Luck or Bus. Jacksonville. You know that's Nick Foles, man. It's going to be DD all day. DD. I know it's Hey, DD. man, he's talented. Going, man. It's a, uh, after the catch, he has decent yards every time. He's able to work it. I mean, my issue is with, like, they have Cole, which who literally led the league last year in drops. Mm-hmm. And then they have Conley, who they just picked up from KC, who I thought was super efficient for what he had with uh, Mahomes. Okay. I, I give you that. They got Chris Conley. I give you that. But, man, this this go back to the Dallas saying what they did with the cap. Like, y'all did all this to get Nick Foles – how much yeah, because Josh Oliver, get? he's nicked up right now. That's the flex tight end that they were trying to get him because all we have is blocking tight ends right now. Like, to Darnell's point, and, you know, I, I understand it. I do. I appreciate you, Jason. But, Darnell, what's basically going to have to happen is D.D. Westbrook is going to have to basically be a poor man's Michael Thomas. That's going to be the only target. Yeah, Chris Conley has been building a good relationship with Nick Foles. When it comes to non-play action, straight up, we need a completion, straight up, we need to get something done, all the targets are about to go to DD Because Marquise, Marquise probably should be cut right now, but we actually paid him, so cap hits. We're basically hoping and praying and waiting that Marquise Lee can be healthy every so often. So you're talking about forcing targets to DD And John DeFilippo has basically said, my running back has no guaranteed money because Tom Coughlin took it away from him. We're giving him the ball and throwing him the ball. On We're that riding same, him the ball off. On that same note, though, I mean, you have, like, they literally targeted the running backs six months behind the Pats, uh, Saints, Chargers, Giants, and Chicago. Like, yeah, TJ was the second leading receiver last year. <laughs> yeah, so you just add those passing to your underneath to Fournette or uh, – well, I guess they have a bunch of injuries there, too. I mean, didn't you, we they just even signed Rawls, didn't they? And he's hurt, too. 
we 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 signed Benny Cunningham to basically uh, be that receiving back. We cut him because he got hurt. So really, it's it's Fournette and Alfred Blue. Wow. And then Houston, um, Connie's holding out. I guess. Uh, what Dallas would like to say, JJ Watt is getting no is not getting no younger. And Deshaun Washington, can you continue to improve and stay healthy? Thank you. To me, Houston has the best wide receiver in the freaking lead in DeAndre. Yeah, I mean, but he needs that 30% of the target share to be that top wide receiver. And, I mean, I really think that uh, Kiki and Fuller both help a lot to take away any kind of defense that they're going to be covering with on Hopkins. Granted, he doesn't really need the help, but it does increase um, the efficiency of Watson and makes Hopkins a better player. Dallas, there's only one receiver in the league last year who did not have I one I mean, if you drop. looked at some of the catches that he made, I, I believe it. This dude does not drop the ball whatsoever. So those are my concerns. And if we're going to go into scheduling, it's the battle for the South, Jason. The ALC South is going against the NLC South. Yeah, man. It's, I mean, I have them winning, I think, 10 games this year, at least in Houston. And then, I mean, same thing for the Colts. I think it's going to be another 10 and 6. So those two will match, in my opinion. Uh, but. You ready for the I'm kicker, helping. though? Mm-hmm. Dallas. Your division got to play the AFC mm-hmm. West division. Uh, yeah, we open up against the Chiefs, so. Yeah, now, just going to get to that. The opening week for the Jacksonville Jaguars, Patrick Mahomes is coming to town. So out the gate, y'all got the reigning MVP. Uh, I'm more yeah. interested in the Colts versus the Chargers that week one, see who really gets off to a hot start there, because I think that's going to be a tough game for sure. Andrew Luck going out west to take on Phillip Rivers. Ooh. That's what we're saying, Andrew Luck. But is it going to be Andrew Luck? Because apparently now it's not even an issue with his cal- and Paris is also but, hey. having that hamstring issue, which might have him held out for the first game, too. So, Also, has Melvin Gordon come back to camp yet? Yeah. No. Oh, so Austin nope, Edwards. he hasn't. And Justin Jackson. They're both there. Well, you know, I mean. <laughs> hey. You got to have that ground about plan player, man. I mean, with uh, Lynn there, that's that's his game. He likes to use those running backs in different ways. You know, during the during the off season, you know that has been very disrespectful. It's warranted. And you know, you might have to shut out the week one because um Marcus Mariota and the Titans got to go up to play them Cleveland Browns week one. Oh, that's gonna be fun. We're gonna see if a, if a safety is worth seventy million dollars that game. Yeah, hopefully they'll be able to cover something up. I mean, they also added Humphreys in the offseason, and I think that's going to help Luck at least. Uh, or, man, Mariota to throw it around a little bit. Uh, but, again, Henry's supposed to be out week one potentially with his uh, calf. I mean, so who are you going to They have John Lewis, and the, the thing with Cleveland is Cleveland used to be a fairly good defensive team and couldn't get it done on offense, but they've switched their focus. So now we're looking at them to be a very high-powered offensive team, but weak on defense. So it's going to depend because Deion Lewis, when you're looking at the two quarterbacks that the Tennessee Titans have on their roster, Deion Lewis is probably going to be one of the leading receivers, if not the leading receiver, at least catch-wise, on that team. I don't really know the underneath situation in the Cleveland Browns starting 11 on defense. They've actually given up a lot of peace. Jamie Collins is back in New England. Danny Shelton's in New England. Joe Hayden's been on the Steelers for a couple years now, so I really don't know the flats and, like, you know, wheel and all that stuff. I don't know who'd be covering that. So if Derrick Henry is hurt, they still might be okay because neither of those quarterbacks are going to get deep regardless. You know, um, yo, Jazz is playing Houston and London. <laughs> they send the Sean Watson. They're going to to London. And then any be. kind of overseas game or even – the Mexico game, that's one thing I I mean, you know, I'm a Chargers fan, so of course I don't want the Chargers playing their home game against the Chiefs in Mexico. I mean, and flying anybody else over to London, you know everybody's tired. It's gonna be one of those weird games you can't predict for fantasy for sure. I mean, you never know how that game's gonna turn out. 
That is true. We'll get the charges next week as we do the West. But uh, Andrew Luck, if you can make it, if you can stay healthy to this point, they got a date with Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh early November. I mean, it, I, I'm, I've been saying it, but you guys aren't listening to me. This division is going to matter who loses the least games, not who wins the most. Because outside of the division, if you're really being like straight up honest about it, this division is not competitive across the entire NFL. You're not putting the Titans against the Saints or the Steelers or the Falcons and like legitimately thinking that they have a chance. The same way you're not going to put the Jaguars up against the Chiefs or the Ravens or something to think to yourselves, they're going to score enough points to keep up. Like, it's really going to be a matter of who gets all the tiebreakers inside can I, can the division. Can I bolster your point? They do got the Patriots going going to Houston for a Sunday night game. They got fun with that. And then they and they got them going yeah, to Baltimore. Again, man, I mean, you don't have – you're not even sure if Clowney's going to be there. I mean, they said – I mean, of course, it's uh, John McClain, you know, so you, it's hard to take with a grain of salt for sure. But they're looking to trade Clowney, and that's going to be a huge hit. I, I think, I think so. that the only thing right now – that could give the Titans and the Jaguars an outside chance looking in is that Andrew Luck is super fragile right now, and he used to take his off the line. I mean, Sean Trail Henderson, a journeyman, and drafting a guy from the FCS, shout out to the HBCUs in Alabama State, in the first round. Like a first-round draft pick that's a rookie who might be playing out of position and a journeyman. Those are your key additions to an offensive line that had, like, a bunch of sacks. So when you're looking at Jarrell Casey and the rest of the defensive line in Tennessee and Josh Allen, Yannick Ngakwe, Calais Campbell, Marcel Darius, hopefully Taven Bryant could turn that corner, that might be how the two teams are probably going to be on the bottom and could catch up. But, I mean, it's – like I said, dude, it's – Anyway, you y'all know I did a poll on Twitter and Facebook, so uh... – you ready for uh-huh. these numbers, Dallas? A total of 78 votes from both Facebook. Coming in at first place is the Indianapolis Colts, 41%. Mm. Second place, the Jacksonville Jaguars with 27%. Oh, they really think that the defensive line is going to hold it together. Well, I mean, maybe they're looking at the strength of schedule for that because, I mean, Jacksonville really does have, like, the third best for – quarterback, I mean, and the fifth for wide receiver for strength of schedule, according to, I mean, granted, that's last year's numbers, but, and then same thing with the Colts. I mean, they have the fourth for QBs as a strength of schedule. I mean, so that might be what they're looking at, but again, it's all based on people being healthy. And that's... The Houston third, 23%, and to Dallas' point, the Tennessee Titans coming last with I 9%. think the reason why the Jaguars are given even that much of a chance, even though it is a social media poll, because I think we didn't get a single vote on Twitter. Um, I think the thing in the NFL is look at the guy who was just voted number one in the NFL top 100. Look at the guy who held out for us. Look at the guy who's holding out in Tennessee. Look at the guys last year that got paid. Aaron Donald got paid last year and led the league in sacks as a 3-4 defensive end and was number one in the NFL Top 100. Khalil Mack, John Gruden didn't want to pay him, so he only went over to Chicago and made Chicago a 6-10 and 10 team look going into the season to, like, an uh, actual we thought they could contend just off their defense. Like, dude, pass rushers, no matter what era of football it is, no matter what rules you legislate, if you have a pass rush, if you have more than one pass rusher, hell, if you even have a generational pass rusher and guys that can just take up space, you're going to be in a lot more games than you're supposed to be. So that's the only reason I can think because the Jaguars definitely prepared for the Yannick situation by drafting Josh Allen. And the year before, even though Taven Bryan's not been looking good so far, they drafted a guy from Florida who was supposed to be a very disruptive interior rusher. So Tom Coughlin, like he did in New York when he was with Giants, he really – focused on giving us a very deep defensive line. The only problem is, like, you know, 
they know, everybody knows, like, the one thing that we are elite at is pass defense. So how often are you really going to try to pass against the Jacksonville Jaguars? If you don't pass, you take that away. Yeah, guys. We got Boyd and uh, Ramsey, so yeah, our secondaries. Yeah, I mean, that's, that goes to the, the point I just said. I mean, if you pass against Jacksonville, if you do get the ball off, you're going, you're throwing it to one of two top ten corners. I mean, if if you're if you're an NFL team and you really want to look like the Indianapolis Colts did, the second game of the season when they played us in Jacksonville and lost six to nothing, go right ahead. Please pass the ball fifty times against the Jacksonville Jaguars and think that you're going to prove a point. Because I mean, that's that's the one way that we would beat people. Just going off of last year and the additions that we made now. That's the one thing we have is the pass defense. Well, that's the NFC South, and the Colts are the favorite, followed by the Jaguars, the Texans, and Titans, which is kind of surprising to me because I thought, you know, they'll be more favorite. Yeah, than the I still Texans think the Texans have a good shot. I mean, granted, you know, Tim Kelly's there for the coach, and he's a OC right now. He worked with Russell Wilson, I mean, and you have that same kind of build with – uh, Watson. I mean, it's going to be a good move there. I mean, and of course they have the coaching assistant is T.J. Yates. I mean, he was a quarterback, so he knows and has some more experience. Granted, he was a backup for most of his games, but still, I guess the big issue there, which uh, is the no GM issue. I mean, Chris Olson is the interim, right? And like, so if people are trying to trade for Clowney or whatever. What what are they going to do? I mean, how's that going to work out for you? It is what it is, you know. This, this is this is what we do. So then, get stuff like this. So that would do it for this week. Yeah, Want to thank no Jason for coming Always on. Always happy to be on and get to talk with y'all. So, so as we get ready to close out, uh, next up, college football, mm-hmm. the Big Twelve, is it okay? To lose, or do we do people think Texas is back in full force and is ready to take over? I'm believe that the Dallas will talk about because it's getting very interesting. I mean, with Jerry Hurts being if your definition of interesting is wondering if OU is going to win the division or win the division and the Heisman, then I mean, you have low bars starting up. I want to speak for you, I'll speak for what I saw so far. Yeah. I think I get I want some time to breathe too, so hopefully get some so, more votes. So yeah, big well. And then on the rest side, that's go ahead. So we're slamming we'll XD right? takeover happens, so we're gonna talk about that. We're also gonna talk about what we hope, because you know we still have stuff to watch during the week could happen. Because as you know, Darnell, after every big four pay-per-view, all you're doing is waiting for the next big four pay-per-view. The only problem is the next big four pay-per-view is Survivor Series. So, I don't know what we're looking forward to because the wild card era has basically taken away the entire allure of brand versus brand and champion versus champion matches. So, we're going to figure out what happened in the aftermath of SummerSlam and the NXT TakeOver. Later. We'll see you next time.